Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I wanted to tell you about a book that's currently available from tonight's author. J Group has a new book that's currently available on Amazon, and it is called No Sleep Tonight. Scary Short Stories. If you like any of the other stories by Jordan Group, or if you like the one tonight, I suggest checking out the link in the description and buying some of his wares. And now, on to tonight's story. I was riding the elevator up to the fourth floor when I noticed it for the first time. When I noticed them for the first time. Someone else was on the elevator with me. Someone I didn't recognize. She was new and looked barely old enough to have graduated high school. And yet her ID badge proclaimed in bold print, Allison Ivers, registered nurse, 8 East Medicine. I had been seeing a lot of new people around the hospital recently, I realized. It was rare to see a single familiar face these days, when I used to run into people I knew all the time. Maybe I was just getting old. I mean, people people were retiring. These new fresh-faced youngsters were coming in and taking their place. Sure, that was probably it. The young woman was dressed in immaculate white scrubs, neatly pressed and matching top and bottoms. Her ID badge clipped to her pocket, but there was something unusual about her. It took me a few moments to figure out what it was, and finally, I realized she was devoid of all possessions, carrying no phone or lunch bag in her hand, no purse or water bottle. It was just her, riding the elevator up to the eighth floor for what I presumed would be a grueling 12-hour shift. My point is, it was odd for her to be empty-handed since usually people at least brought a backpack or a purse to work with them. Most people were also carrying coffee cups this time of day, like I was. But she had nothing. Then I saw something else that was strange. The woman's hair had been blown askew in the wind outside, revealing a thin, notched groove on the back of her neck, like something that you'd see in an air conditioner on a car, concealing a control panel. At least, that's what it reminded me of. She noticed me looking and self-consciously covered her neck with her hand, preventing me from examining it any further. I mean, I was so overcome with curiosity that I almost asked her about it, despite her discomfort. But then the elevator dinged and the door opened to the fourth floor. People were waiting to get on, and I had to hurry up and get to my shift. So I left the elevator reluctantly, feeling confused, to say the least. I couldn't help but think about that in the following weeks as I noticed more and more young-looking nurses and doctors, cleaners and food service staff, not only young, but beautiful as well. The older staff members began to disappear one by one, and I was always told it was an early retirement or a family emergency, bereavement leave, or that people simply left to work at other jobs. And yet there was no going away parties, no, no retirement celebrations. One thing was consistent. The young, beautiful people in white scrubs always came in to take their jobs. The new people started taking over management positions next, becoming charge nurses, clinical managers, head doctors, as more and more fresh faces showed up week after week. I started to notice the difference. Their skin had a slightly waxy sheen to it, sometimes a little plastic looking in the right sort of light. They were all without exception, punctual and methodical, brutally efficient and quick to point out the errors of less perfect co-workers. It started getting harder and harder to keep up. I started getting warnings from the new nursing manager, saying my performance was lagging far behind that of my co-workers that I was too slow and I couldn't keep up with the increasingly advanced computer systems they were bringing in to monitor the patients and document status changes. And then, one night during a graveyard shift, I began to realize what was happening. I had suspected it, sure, but who really believes such delusional, paranoid fantasies? The funny thing was, the revelation, the, the unveiling, all of it, was a complete accident. A little bit of serendipity, I'd say. I was reading a technology article on the computer during my break at the desk. As usual, it was it was too busy to leave the floor, and the hospital had 
had made substantial cutbacks so that we never seemed to have time for proper breaks anymore. Each nurse's patient workload had doubled, and if we left our post, it would mean some confused patient falling and breaking their hip due to a bad alarm not being answered in time. So we just stayed put in fear of losing our nursing licenses. At least I did. The only other nurse I knew who remained on the unit was Melanie. She and I had been working there together for 10 years and had stuck it out through all the recent changes. We were surrounded by fresh-faced young nurses and neatly pressed white scrubs, all new to the hospital within the past few months, as far as I can remember. Still, I was starting to get used to it, starting to adapt to the changes. So much so that I forgot about them all around us, as the news articles mesmerized me more and more as I started to read aloud. Hey, get this, Mel, I said, getting her attention and speaking loudly. Within the next 10 years, robots will have taken over about 20 million jobs by 2030, and the U.S. alone already lost 60 million jobs. We had just been discussing this exact phenomenon more and more recently, just a few hours before, in fact. Melanie's uncle had lost his job to an automation, and others in her family were finding it next to impossible to find jobs in their chosen fields these days. And all the tasks that had once been well-paying jobs for people were now simply... Good thing robots could ever take our jobs, right? I heard a brief whirring sound that seemed to come from everywhere at once, and looked up to see a half dozen faces of white-clad co-workers all sharply staring at me. Every staff member sitting at the nursing stations was glaring at me. I wouldn't be so sure. Over in Japan, they've got nurse robots in long-term care homes. They deliver pills, check vital signs, hell, they give the patients a damn cuddle and sing them songs, even. Can you imagine? I mean, they couldn't replace us entirely, not yet. But if you get a fleet of those things in a hospital, you only need a few real nurses. As Melanie spoke, the nurses and doctors in their white scrubs slowly stood, all at the same time in unison. Their movements were smooth and organized, each one a perfect replication of humanity. My voice was caught in my throat as I tried to speak, to warn Melanie of the white-clad androids who were closing in on us from all sides. I... I had never felt so terrified. My voice was caught in my throat as I tried to speak, to warn Melanie of the white-clad androids who were closing in on us from all sides. I had never felt so terrified. My vocal cords suddenly incapable of producing speech. Only a hoarse whisper came out, my trembling hand reaching up to touch Mel's shoulder to, to pull her away from the computer so that she could see for herself. She was focused on her documentation and, and didn't see them. What? Stop! What's your deal? Why are you pinching me? She was shouting as I squeezed her shoulder involuntarily harder than I meant to. But it was too late. They were all around us. They could tell that I knew more than I was supposed to. She finally turned around just in time to see a half dozen vaguely plastic-skinned people standing in a circle around us. They were youthful, fresh-faced, and dressed in immaculate white scrubs without a stain on them, smiling without happiness. You should not be reading that news article at work, said one nurse in a monotone voice. It is not appropriate. Please observe the rules and guidelines set forth by management at all times. Thank you. I was going to play it cool, but I looked at Melanie and saw it was far too late for that now. She was terrified, stuttering, pointing with a trembling hand at the robotic humanoid surrounding us. You... None of you are... What the hell is happening here? The androids who had been replacing our co-workers did not appreciate being noticed. Whoever had created them and installed them did not want them to be seen. Their eyes began to glow red and their smiling faces turned to sharp-toothed sneers. Terrified, I tried to stand up to defend myself but immediately found myself on the ground, my head bleeding and aching after a sharp blow to the temple from one of them. I hadn't even seen it coming. Melanie was on the ground next to me, appearing half-conscious from a similar injury. The androids stood around us, looking down unsympathetically, raising their boots to crush our skulls beneath their feet. When they froze, the overhead PA crackled to life and I heard the bored voice of the switchboard operator. Attention, please. Code gray. Wi-Fi down. Code gray. Wi-Fi down. Code gray. Wi-Fi down. She had said literally the only words that could have saved our lives. The hospital Wi-Fi had gone down temporarily, and apparently, this had caused the robots to malfunction. 
I got up breathlessly panting and pulling Melanie to her feet next to me. We didn't have time to consider what had just happened and how we had almost been killed by our imposter co-workers. Before we could say a word to each other, a monitor began to alarm, indicating a patient had taken the turn for the worse. 8-2 is in VTAC! I yelled, disbelief in my voice. And who would have thought this night could get any worse? After rushing to the room and calling a code blue, we performed CPR on the pulseless patient. A dozen other familiar staff members came to the floor and helped us save them, referring the person to the ICU after reviving them. How short-staffed are you on the fourth floor these days? Asked one nurse in the aftermath. I know there's been cutbacks lately, but this is ridiculous. It's just been you two the whole floor? This patient's lucky to be alive. I mean, I didn't understand at first. Then I realized. All the new nurses in white scrubs were gone. Whisked away to a repair lab somewhere, I guess. They're gonna need to hire more people again, I said. Melanie sighed dejectedly. There'd be plenty of hard days ahead of us until we were fully staffed again. Actually, you wouldn't believe what I just read about the things they're doing in Japan. Robot nurses. It's wild stuff, said a critical care nurse at the bedside. She had been able to get an IV when none of the rest of us could have. She flipped her hair back. And as she did, a simple, notched groove on her neck, barely noticeable. But there. The woman caught me looking and dropped a sly wink. But nobody saw but me. Some of the better ones even run on 5G. Hey there once again, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or, you know, listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Before we say goodnight, I'd like to let you guys know about a couple of books that are available right now if you guys check out Amazon uh, before it becomes too late to get them and they're completely sold out. The Neverglade Mysteries Volume 3 should be available on Amazon very, very soon. If you guys have been keeping up with the Neverglade Mysteries, then you definitely don't want to miss out on this one. This is going to be the brand newest book and the adventures of the inspector cannot be missed. The complete version of My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown is available right now on Amazon as well. Big, thick, hardcover book, and you guys can get all the adventures as well as some insight into the next volume that should be available in that series. And of course, there's two new audiobooks from me. Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 is available on Audible, and you can check out the newest Audible book from Vincent Vinacava, Pastel Colored Dreams and Human Flavored Nightmares. Both of those, very fun to work on, and I hope all of you guys enjoy them. And as always, I want to give a very huge thank you to all of my supporters out there on Patreon. I say this every time, but I truly mean it. You guys are the real MVPs, and without you, I don't think I would be able to continue doing this at the capacity that I do. Especially not as many brand new custom stories as we've been getting just for the channel. So a very special thank you to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Ken Landa Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764, The Banana Mafia 1, Hollow Hero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faya Lockett, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azreen Fox, Robert White, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys once again so, so much. And if you would like to join this list of people's names that I mispronounce, or the list of people's names that are down there in the description, check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta. And as always, a very sweet dreams to all of you. Good night, folks. <laughs>